Good day, philosophers. Here, we're going to have a video that's a kind of a brief interlude into mathematics as we read and discuss Descartes' discourse on method. And very interestingly, that René Descartes was both a mathematician and a philosopher. So understanding a little bit about math will really help us understand the way that he criticized philosophy and praised mathematics. Now, remember when, when we were reading in part one that Descartes fundamentally said that math is has its certainty from the certain evidence of its reasoning and its solid foundation. And we got that right out of part one of the discourse, right? And so for me today, I want us to really understand what does he mean by the solid foundations and the certain evidence of its reasoning. And, and the key connection here is that for Descartes, in particular with the idea of foundation, Descartes is ultimately going to say that philosophy requires a new foundation in order for philosophy to really be philosophy, in order to have its certainty and its usefulness, right? And so let's 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 a brief interlude into into mathematics, right? Descartes, just as a as as a as a as a big um a big idea, just to give you a historical perspective, right? He developed something that's called analytic geometry. And analytic geometry was sort of this combining of uh, a classical sort of geometry with algebra, right? Um, Descartes in, uh, really developed this guy right here. And what's this? You probably learned this in high school algebra. This is the X and Y axis. This is called the coordinate plane. It's also known as the Cartesian plane. And what it allows, instead of just having shapes that are sort of just drawn on a flat surface, you're now able to sort of draw shapes on a coordinate plane. And it allows you to come up with algebraic expressions that represent values of X and, and values of Y and how they're interconnected. So for instance, this little uh, line segment right here falls on a line that uh, has the equation Y equals zero. This line segment here falls on the line whose equation is X equals zero. And then uh, depending on exactly how high up this line goes, perhaps this is something like uh, y equals negative x plus one or something like that. And we could talk about those expressions, right? This also becomes really powerful when, you, for instance, you want to represent the, a circle. A circle up to, to, uh, to now in geometry is simply defined as all the points equidistant from a single point. But um, say we drew a circle like this, and let's say we said it had a radius of one. So this was uh, located at one zero. You could actually see that the equation of this circle would be x squared plus y squared equals one. Right, And that's actually just based on the good old Pythagorean theorem, uh, where you could say any particular point here, you could imagine drawing um, a right triangle like that. And if you were to take the x coordinate of this uh, squared plus the y coordinates of this squared and then um, solve it for wherever it equals one to say this guy has a radius of one that will tell you all the points on the circle. So isn't that fun? Descartes developed this analytic geometry, right? And so we're going to actually think about geometry um, in our connection to trying to understand how Descartes is, is um, fundamentally trying to help us understand the evidence and the foundation um, of mathematics and how that can um, be applied in uh um, philosophy. Okay, but let's 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 take a step back. Let's let's just think about um, this pattern real quick. Just uh, indulge me in, in our interlude in mathematics. Say I was to just write down. I wrote down the numbers one and two, and then I wrote down the number after it. I wrote down the number three, and then you might say, "What number do you think I'm going to write next?" Um, you might. How about five? Huh. Okay. Why five? All right. So I wrote down five, but maybe that was expected. Maybe it wasn't. What number will I write down now? I'm going to write down eight. Okay, and then I'm going to write down 13. What number would I write next? Now, some of you, if you're educated in something called the Fibonacci sequence, Fibonacci, you might see that this is actually something that sort of resembles the Fibonacci sequence. You might wonder, what is the pattern here? Well, your first inclination when you saw this, you might have thought that this was supposed to be one, two, three, obviously four. Well, what's actually happening? Um, uh, if you notice, this number three is really the sum of one plus two. So three is one plus two. And then what's five? Five is the sum of two plus three. It's two plus three. And then eight is uh, the sum of three plus five. That's three plus five. And 13 is five plus eight. So what number would come next? Well, it should, the next number should be eight plus 13, which is going to be 21 and so on. And so you could see how this pattern would continue. So why do I present this cute little example? Well, this starts to set up a fundamental distinction force and just thinking about reasoning in general. Because remember, Descartes started off by saying that mathematics has certain evidence of reasoning. What kind of reasoning did we just use? What's the reasoning behind us thinking in this pattern? There's ultimately two types of reasoning that were going on there. Um, one type of reasoning is what we'll call inductive reasoning. 
And another type of reasoning is called deductive reasoning, right? And when were we using each? Inductive reasoning is when we sort of reason from patterns and similarities that we notice, right? So for instance, you are using inductive reasoning as you are trying to figure out what's the pattern that's continuing here, right? I'm saying, oh, I saw one and two and I saw three. That fits with my expectation of the, the pattern is just numbers going up by one. It should be four. And then all of a sudden, when it departed from that pattern, your inductive mind is like, hmm, I don't think that pattern's the right one anymore. Let me think about it some more. And you're looking, looking, looking for patterns. Inductively, that's what we do. We sort of look at the patterns uh, and similarities that we notice in nature and try to draw conclusions based on it. Deductive reasoning is when we're sort of applying rules of thinking, when we're um, drawing out what would be the necessary conclusion. Once you recognize the pattern here and you realize, oh, this pattern is add the two previous terms. So if it's add the two, that says two previous terms, as soon as you see that pattern and you put it in your head deductively, you start to work it out, right? Um, you start to simply apply the pattern. So deductively speaking, you're not sitting here trying to figure out what the pattern is anymore. Once you know the pattern, then you're just working it out. What would come after 21? Well, what uh, deductively, you would say if the pattern is add the two previous terms and the two previous teams are 13 and 21, then I should simply add them up and that would come out to uh, what, 34, right? And then um, that would be the next term in our pattern. And that would be deductive thinking. Deductive th thinking always has absolutely certain conclusions. You always have complete uncertainty in your conclusions there. Inductive thinking will only have probable conclusions. And so which type of reasoning do you think Descartes is really going to love for us? As you can imagine, he's going to love certainty. He wants us to have certainty. Remember, his fundamental goals of education were certainty and usefulness. So Descartes is going to want to have us to have certain reasoning, right? And so deductive reasoning is like that. All right. Now, I just talked about deductive reasoning in terms of of mathematics, let's see some de deductive reasoning just in terms of more logical statements. And this very first statement is sort of uh, my version of a very cliche example. And anytime anyone's doing logic, um, the, the first statement is all men are mortal. Zach is a man. Now, as soon as you hear these two phrases, what's the immediate conclusion your mind is going to draw? All men are mortal. Zach is a man. With me, I can't help but think, as soon as I think uh, all men are mortal and Zach is a man, I have to think that Zach is a mortal. I can't help but think it, right? I just know that it has to be true. Why? Because I know all men are mortal. Okay, I'm just going to accept that's true the way it was written. Mortal means you're going to die, right? Um, Zach is a man. Well, you can accept that as true. I mean, I, I'm Zach. I mean, I can't prove to you that I'm a man, I guess, you know, um, but but just believe me. But if it's true that all men are mortal and Zach is a man, you're absolutely guaranteed that Zach is a mortal. Um, let's look at the second statement. It has snowed in Maine every January in recorded history. What does this make you think? Well, could make you think a couple of things, but perhaps uh, maybe you might, are going to think this January, this January, it will snow in Maine, right? It is currently, right now, as I speak, it is, uh, what is it? It's April still, right? So January is a long way away. It's This is April 20, uh, 2020 and January 2021. It'll probably snow in Maine, right? Now, which of these two conclusions are you more certain about? That Zach is immortal based on this evidence or that it will snow in uh, Maine in January based on this evidence? Well, based on the evidence itself, this is going to be an absolutely certain conclusion, right? And this right here, my friends, is going to only be a probable conclusion. Is it possible that it might not snow in Maine in January? It is. I mean, it's not plausible. I'm almost, it seems obvious to me that it's going to happen, but it's not as guaranteed. If it's really true that all men are mortal, if we believe that, and if we believe Zach is a man, then it has to be the case that Zach is immortal. The only way to attack this is by attacking the factuality of these two statements. If these two statements are true, then this conclusion has to be true. However, if it's true that it has snowed in Maine every January in recorded history, it doesn't guarantee the fact that it will snow in Maine now, right? And so mathematics and the way it's set up and the way we learn it is it fundamentally operates in a kind of deductive way that we must be using deductive reasoning right here. Um, and this here must be inductive reasoning. Um, and so 
when Descartes says that mathematics is ultimately going to be a model for how we're going to do philosophy, he's going to want to develop a foundation for philosophy and a kind of reasoning that's that uh, that emulates this sort of deductive approach that begins with principles that we accept and know are true and then draw absolutely certain conclusions based on them. Now, you might think back to high school geometry, and for some of you, high school geometry was scary, right? And what, what why was high school geometry scary? Probably because because in high school geometry, you had to write proofs. And I actually, I'm going to give you a flashback right now. We are actually going to do a very quick proof right now. And one of the reasons why I love geometry and why I think people should study geometry is because it's a real beautiful introduction into the rigor of deductive reasoning that we have to follow. Um, one, and, and, and again, there's going to be a reason that we talk about these, um, we talk about proofs because there's a fundamental distinction that we need to get to about what really counts as a foundation. What are the foundational ideas of mathematics? When we talk about the foundation of mathematics, what are these fun, uh, foundational ideas? What are they called? And how are they different from some other ideas? And uh, one of the best ways to try to understand them is to try to understand what's going on in a proof in geometry. So here we're actually going to do a quick proof, right? And this is a famous statement. Almost everyone should know, I hope everyone knows this, that the sum of the angles of a triangle is always 180 degrees, no matter the triangle. So I drew a little triangle here. It's a scaling triangle and I numbered its angles one, two, and three. And so in this particular context, what I'd want want to try to prove is I'd want to try to prove that uh, that the measure of angle one plus the measure of angle two plus the measure of angle three actually equals 180 degrees. And and so and when we were doing geometry proofs, there's a, several ways you might have done it, but you might have done something like you have some kind of statement here, a statement, and then you have some kind of reason that justifies it, right? And I'm not going to maybe, I'm going to try to be fairly thorough in our proof here, maybe not perfect, but fairly thorough. So all right, let's begin. Um, it's 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 given to us that this is a triangle, right? So we have I'm going to call this triangle ABC, and I'm going to say number n number one, we're given uh, triangle ABC, and that's just given to us. So that's nice. Um, now next kind of fact here, what do we know? Well. Um, I'm going to do, I'm going to do something. I'm going to draw something that's called an auxiliary. I'm going to draw an auxiliary line. I'm going to draw a line that, um, that goes through point B, right? Point B here. That's, I'm going to say is parallel to, to segment AC, right? Um, it's possible to draw this line, right? And actually, uh, why, how is it possible to draw this line? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to say that, uh, that there, there exists, um, I'm going to say uh, well, that AC, right? AC, and I'm going to call this line here, I'm going to call it L1 just for fun, right? I'm going to say AC is parallel to L1. And, and now what allows me to say that? Well, this is actually something that, that history, I'm going to call it by this name, and there's a good reason for it. This is actually Euclid's fifth postulate. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm going to explain it in just a second. And the idea is this, that if you have a line Excuse me. Here's a here's a here's it. We could extend this out to be going on forever. Remember, lines go on forever. If you have a line and a point not on that line, do you agree that B is not on the line AC? It's always possible to draw a line through point B that's parallel to 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 some line AC, right? Through any point not on a line, there's always at least or is it not at least there's always exactly one line on that plane that would be parallel to our original line, right? Um, and so I can draw a line that goes through B that would be parallel to AC. Euclid's fifth postulate guarantees that. And I wanna come back to that word postulate in just a minute. And in fact, let me write that more neatly, postulates, because postulates are gonna be really what I want us to talk about in this little class today. Oh, let's finish the proof, right? So as soon as I know that, um, that, uh, that we have these parallel lines, I could uh, label some new angles. I could label like this angle, angle four, and this angle, angle five, right? And then uh, there's actually a relationship that exists here between, let me get a different color, between angle five and angle three. These two angles are gonna have to be um, uh, going to have to be congruent, right? Why are they going to be congruent? Well, you might remember this. I could say that angle three is congruent to angle five, and that's because of alternate interior angles. Um, 
you, there's, I'm just writing the name here, alternate interior angles, that if you have uh, two parallel lines and a transversal cutting both of those lines, the alternate interior angles will be congruent. For the exact same reason, I could say that angle one and angle four are congruent. Angle one is congruent to angle four. And for the exact same reason, because they are also alternate interior angles, we could say AB is this transversal of these two parallel lines. And so one and four are also gonna be congruent angles. So that's nice. Um, now, what's another fact that I notice here? Well, I notice that four, two, and five all combine together to make a single straight angle. I know that the measure of angle one plus the measure of angle four, or excuse me, measure of angle, excuse me, measure of angle four plus the measure of angle two plus the measure of angle five, I know that they all have to add up to 180 degrees because they are, um, they, they have form up the definition of a straight angle, right? Um, they, all combined together to be a straight angle. And I could use the angle um, uh, addition um, postulates, right? That you can always add uh, angles up. That's called the angle addition postulate. And then uh, I, I can then use substitution, right? Um, I can, so I know, in fact, let me change these to measures, the measure of angle three, the measure of angle five, measure of angle one, measure of angle four. Since I know three and five are the same, I can swap them out. And I know one and four are the same, I can swap them out. So I could write the measure of angle one plus the measure of angle two plus the measure of angle three um, equals 180 degrees. And um, that uh, is simply by, let me write here, by substitution. And uh, so the key idea here is uh, oh, I'm done. I just proved what I wanted to prove. Now, I, what I just did here is I proved beyond any doubt, it is impossible for it to be the case that the sum of the angles of a triangle is not 180 degrees. Why? Because I led you through a perfectly deductive proof that as long as you understood these reasons and you un get guaranteed that, that and by understanding these reasons, you, you could see how they're all perfectly collect, uh, connected to lead to this fundamental conclusion, right? This is a beautiful set of deductive reasoning. Now, the only way for you to challenge this proof, to try to prove that a triangle is not 180 degrees, is by you trying to challenge one of my reasons. Are, are, are there any of these reasons that you could possibly challenge, right? Are there any of the reasons that I gave here that you think are in fact false? Just like how you, the only way you could criticize my argument that I'm going to die one day, Zach is immortal, is by trying to either prove that I'm not a man or trying to prove that all men are more, aren't mortal. The only way for you to reject this geometric proof is to try to reject one of these reasons. So the real question is, how do we know that these reasons are true? And we should really think about mathematics in general. Um, some of these reasons were actually something that we'll call in math a theorem. For instance, alternate interior angles being congruent was a kind of theorem. In math, we have theorems, right? And where do theorems come from? Well, theorems are all proven. Uh, theorems are proven based on previous theorems. Pre previous theorems. Um, so that's one option, either previous theorems, they're based on the definitions of things that we'll give. And, but they're, and they're also proven sometimes based on postulates. Now, what the heck is a postulate, right? When we're talking about a postulate, right? And so if you think about it, like here's some theorem here, like we'll, we'll say here's a theorem, right? And this theorem is proven say based on um, some theorem over here, and then some definition right here. And let's say that this theorem here, well, it's proven based on um, another theorem, um, this theorem, and I'm just making stuff up here and you can't even read my handwriting. And 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 where do these theorems come from, right? Um, well, maybe this guy is actually based on, do you agree that if I kept drawing this, all I, I, if I was to talk about how theorems are based on 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 theorems, I'd be going on forever. It's like there'd be no end to this. That fundamentally, at some point, you need to have a beginning point, a, a foundation for all of this ch chain of reasoning. And that's what we see in the postulates, right? The ultimate foundation for all of this are the postulates. The postulates um, will be this foundation that, that leads to any fundamental theorem that will uh, go up the chain. Sometimes the postulates will be brought in in multiple locations later on in a chain, but a postulate is the beginning of all proof. Every theorem begins with a postulate. And I actually mentioned a couple of postulates. I mentioned Euclid's fifth postulate, which had to do with the existence of a line parallel to a second line through a point not on it, right? 
And then I also talked about the angle addition postulate. You can always add angles up. What is a postulate? Well, a theorem was something that's proven based on previous theorems, definitions, and postulates, but a postulate is something that is not proven based on other things. So like the, a postulate is a self evidently true, self evidently true statement. Um, it, it is, it is not never proven, right? It's not that it's, it's instead of being proven, it is the basis, the basis for all proof, right? And so, um, in geometry and in mathematics in general, we set up these, these postulates to be the foundation of our mathematical system that will, will, will list a series of postulates like Euclid's fifth postulate, like the angle addition postulate and things like that. And based on those postulates and, 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 and setting up some definitions, we'll prove all the theorems that there are to be proven, right? And we could sit here and prove the Pythagorean theorem right now. And if we went through that proof, eventually we'd, be at, we'd arrive at some postulates that were the foundation for that. And the key idea here is that a postulate has to be something that's self-evidently true. That it, it, and to say self-evident, we, we said all other things are self-evident. In the United States of America, we say that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, right? And what do we mean when we say that that's self-evident? We mean that it's not something we're going to argue about. It's not something for us to talk about. Uh, I mean, excuse me, it's not we can absolutely talk about it. It's not something for us to debate. Something that as a postulate that's self-evidently true is not open for debate. And why is it not open for debate? It's obviously true. If you don't see it's true, then we can't even have a discussion. If you don't see that it's true that all men are created equal in America, it's not that I'm going to sit here and try to prove to you that all men are equal. You should obviously know it. And if you don't know it, then there's something wrong. Get out. Might as well leave, right? And in mathematics, if the postulates are like that as well too. Something that is absolutely self-evidently true that if you don't see and understand why they're the case, then there's something um, um, faulty, right? So if you don't understand Euclid's fifth postulate, it's because I didn't um, I didn't present it sufficiently clear to you, and I can present it to you again, and maybe I will very quickly at the end of this video. But the key idea of a postulate is that if you simply understand the words, you know that they are true, and that's what Descartes wants. When Descartes says that he we need a new foundation. Let me go back here, right? We need a new foundation for philosophy. He means we need some type of self-evidently true foundation. We need something that's self-evident. Something that is, as soon as you hear those words, it's impossible for you to doubt them. That all people can immediately know that they're the case. Remember Descartes said philosophy was doubtful because it's always disputed. He wants something to be the beginning, the starting point for philosophy that no one can doubt. From that starting point, he wanted us then to use deductive reasoning to draw all of our conclusions, to have something that we all know is in fact absolutely true and then prove based on that foundation and, and clear um, clear deductive lines of reasoning that, um, that, that these ideas are exactly the case, right? That's what Descartes wants in the Discourse on Method. That's why he's going to set up a particular method here in part two of the discourse where he's going to try to arrive at an absolutely fundamentally certain conclusions, right? So beginning with a fundamentally certain foundation. And once he finds that certain foundation, we'll be off to the races. In part four, we'll see where Descartes arrives at the foundation for philosophy by carrying out this method of challenging everything that he can in any way doubt. And once he has that foundation, we'll see how he sort of tries to rebuild philosophy based on that foundation. Okay. So anyway, I promised one more time, I wanted to explain, if you want to stop watching, you can stop watching. You can always, you could have stopped watching forever ago, but I just wanted to explain Euclid's fifth postulate one more time to make sure that it was more self-evidently true to you. Like on a piece of paper right now, draw a line. There's a line. Um, uh, now, draw some point that's on that same piece of paper, on the same plane, but not on the line. There you go. You agree? Now, how many lines exist through this particular point? An infinite number of lines. Do you see that there's an infinite number of lines that go through this point? Um, now, of all the lines I could draw through this point, right? And uh, uh, how many of the lines through this point are parallel to this line? One. Exactly one. And I can roughly draw it right now right? Boom. 
That's Euclid's fifth postulate. That if you have some line and some point not on that line, there exists exactly one line through that point that would be parallel to our original line there. And that's all the postulate says. Nothing fancier than that. You can always draw a line through a point that would be parallel to some other line on the same plane. Good times. That is a postulate. That is something that it's impossible to doubt. It is obviously true. And that is what Descartes wants to find for philosophy. He wants to find a new foundation for something that cannot be doubted. Friends, have a beautiful day. Catch you on the flip side.